Do not adjust your digital device. What you are about to see and hear may shock and appall you. Join our hosts as they encounter countless thrills, spills, chills, and hilarity as they explore the very weirdest in pop culture. The following media is so strange, so beyond the scope of what is normal, it will make you ask the question, why does this exist? and welcome to another episode of Why Does This Exist? I'm Chris. I'm Rob. And today we have a wonderful show. We are about to kick off our Halloween with a very, very, very magical musician who embodies the spirit of Halloween. In fact, he has a song called Halloween. And he's, you know, and he's Danish, which I don't know what that means, but he's Danish, damn it. <laughs> We're talking about King Diamond, the the supernatural, spooky man who uh, I've actually been I've actually dressed up as King Diamond for Halloween, on multiple occasions. Um, he's 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 a he's a cool little Danish man, who lives in Texas next to at one point lived next to a priest, and that's interesting. But before that, I will rip into our spiel really quickly and really 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 justly but uh we are why does this exist we talk about the weirdest things in pop culture and that can be anything that's past present future product toy um movie music anything and, and anything of that nature the pet rock could even be an episode one day maybe may, maybe that will be maybe that won't be Authors, um, speaking of which, for our Halloween stuff, we've got Edgar Allan Poe coming up. And if you liked something like that, then why not check out our H.P. Lovecraft episode if you've got about two and a half hours to kill. We talk about anything and everything that was weird that happened in pop culture in some way, shape, or form. And we love doing it, and we love that you guys love listening to us. And that's really cool, and we appreciate that. If you want to send us some, uh, if you want to send us some feedback or some fan mail, or just let us know if there's something that's like on the tip of your tongue that you want to talk about, then feel free to do so by like heading over to um, why does this exist show at gmail.com and sending us an email there, or head over to our YouTube channel. The YouTube channel is of course why does this exist, and we've got all of our episodes. We've also got some of them broken down into a bunch of clips. I've got to, I've, I've got to get on the. Uh, clip editing and the uh, video and like just the video uploading and everything. It's a meticulous project, but I got to do that. Um, you can comment and like and subscribe to our channel over there and you can give us our feedback on that stuff. But you can also find us on social media. You can find us on Twitter at WDTE pod as in why does this exist pod on Twitter. Um, and you can also like us on Facebook and uh, find us there at Why Does This Exist Pod, Facebook.com slash Why Does This Exist Pod. And if you want to give us a little bit of extra money for, you know, a couple of little perks, they're not the greatest perks, but they're perks, you can head on over to the show and support us on Patreon. You can head on over to Patreon and support the show. Excuse me. It's uh, 1030 p.m. on a Tuesday. Patreon.com slash Why Does This Exist. That's where you can give us your money, and that would be really swell. Thank you. We would be able to catch up on our bills and pay off things like an engagement ring. <laughs> you can also find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, Pandora, TuneIn, Alexa, iHeartRadio, Player FM, Listen Notes, and Stitcher. The TLD, T, TLDR is everywhere that podcasts are available. That is my spiel. That is the news. Here is the weather. 
You are about to witness the strength of streak of street knowledge. Streak knowledge. Streak knowledge. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> We all have to run down the street streaking now. But what <laughs> while rapping. What is streak knowledge? Do you is, like do you run down the do, do you streak while shouting every while spouting off your knowledge, or are you or or do you do just run down the street totally naked with, like with with the most with the most useful facts painted across your body? How does that work? No, you just wear a flesh toned bodysuit. <laughs> and do you just shout things? Yeah. All right, I guess I can do some streak knowledge. No, you are about to witness the strength of street knowledge from a group of ragtag rogues. Let's get on with the goddamn show. All right, now I've done it. Here we go. King Diamond. Yes. Also known as Kim Bendix Peterson. Yes, his name is Kim. Which, yeah, I, I guess that's the Danish name. It's probably a popular one, too. Yeah, I mean, obviously, in here it's in America, like, it's a woman's it, name, but you know, yeah, didn't they're like, a little different in Danish? Yeah, it's probably like Jim, <laughs> Jim, <laughs> Kim, I Jim. I don't know if Kim is short for if Kim is short for Kames, then yes, Kames. Hey, <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> oh, but yes, King Diamond. He's a he's a Danish metal musician, and uh, he's known he's known for several things. Actually, he's known like he's um he he wears a bunch of like he he kind of dresses you know like a Satanist priest. Basically, he um he wears a bunch of like he wears a bunch of like black and white makeup uh, for black metal folks or like metal fans. We call it corpse paint. Even though you don't really look like a corpse, you just kind of look cool. Um, similar to the kiss paint, but uh, there were uh, there were some legal ramifications there between him and Gene Simmons for some ridiculous reasons. We'll get into well, fucking Gene Simmons is just an asshole. He also tried to copyright the fucking metal horn, saying he invented it. So yeah, which is he, not he, true because it's the no. Maloik, which the Maloik is an ancient Italian like superstitious symbol. Yeah, and fucking Dio was doing it in like the '60s, so he can right. suck off. Right. I hate he, Gene Simmons. He He's a douchebag. He entertains me. Like every once in a while, if I see like some stupid Kiss thing, I'll buy it just specifically because this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Like, um, I was actually telling my fiance um, once, uh, like maybe less than an hour ago, while we were brushing our teeth, that. Uh, I once had a kiss. Uh, I had a Gene Simmons electric toothbrush. Oh my god! Because I saw is that the one that used to sing like uh, it used to sing in your mouth while you like brushed your teeth or whatever? Yeah, it did do that actually. I it was that. and it was like just fucking like party all you know. It was like yeah, it was ah, rock I want rock and roll all, all night. night. Yeah, yeah, okay, I remember like, that. From... Yeah, it was like this doesn't apply to toothbrushing. I don't know how you want to like rock my jaw all night, but all right. Um, but yeah, I actually bought that at Rite Aid, and I that that's the like that's the only reason why I own it is because why well, I, I owned it. I saw it in Rite, Aid and I was like, "What the hell is this doing here?" I kind of like, and then I pushed the button, and I was like, "Oh Jesus Christ, it's going in my house." <laughs> <laughs> so, See, I, I for me, I like I Kiss is okay. Like they have some okay songs, but Gene Simmons is like the king of fucking out of touch dinosaurs that just need to retire and shut their mouths about anything because he's so out of touch with like rock music and everything else that and he's just like completely in that another realm like basically well, yeah, of, of Gene, like Gene fucking been... stupid takes that he has to, you know about shit well, Gene has been living on Planet Gene for quite some time now, and it's not. Yes. It's pretty difficult to get him off of that. So th that's that's really the best explanation I have. Is a similar explanation to what Kevin Smith was told about Prince <laughs> when he was shooting a documentary that wound up going into the vault, and no one will ever see it. Um, if you want that story, you'll have to watch an evening with Kevin Smith. I believe it's in the first one. The clip, I haven't been able to find it on YouTube anymore, but it's freaking hilarious. Um, anyway, but we'll get into the legal crap in a little bit. 
But King Diamond, he, 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 he puts on his face paint. He dresses like a satanic priest. He's got a neat little top hat, which I really like. And he, um, he, he also, he has a very unique singing voice. He, um, it, it goes into, it, he, he moves various octaves across songs, um, where, where it's like, it'll get low and then he'll sing low and then he'll sing high. And that's kind of how, that's kind of the gist of King Diamond's songs. Yeah. Um, He's well known for his falsetto voice. Yes. Which is um, very, very high. Uh, and which is pretty, it's pretty common in, in a lot of like metal music, especially in the 80s, like power metal. There was a lot of like very high singing, but I think he goes to like another level of like yeah, high singing. I, he abuses it and he uses yeah. it like, but not in like a bad way. Like he, you, oh. he uses it in like very specific points of the songs. And it's all and that, that, that it also has to do with his songwriting with his lyric writing because most of his albums are concept albums yes um if you don't know what that is a concept album is basically the songs are all interconnected by a story and like the mm -hmm. album tells one story from like beginning to end they're like you'll see it pop up every once in a while but there aren't many like but there aren't many artists that do it that like all of their albums for the most part are concept albums. I think they're, yeah. I think like all of them have a plot for the most part, except for, I want to say fatal. I, I think fatal portrait was his only one that really and wasn't a full concept album was fatal portrait. Um, I think every single one after that was pretty much. Um, it's either the eye or the spider's lullaby where one of them is, um, it has two separate stories in it. Okay, yeah, so The Spider's Lullaby was not a full concept album. Only half yeah. the songs were on a single plot. Yeah, and then I think the other ones were just regular songs. But they all have some kind of, like, dark macabre, you know, theme going on. All of his cons all of his albums are horror, are, are horror novels, essentially. You're, like, yes. listening to a horror novel. Um, yeah. Or, like, listening to a horror movie. And, and actually have, like, a really... Know like deep backstory like the friggin the backstory of like abigail and abigail 2 is like huge there's like a, the the liner notes you know we talked about this on the cd episodes about how cool liner notes were and stuff and like for king diamond albums they were really cool because like the liner notes of Ab like his albums like explain like the backstory of of the concept and like abigail and abigail 2 has so much extra information they have like a uh, a timeline and like uh, I think there's like a family tree of like the fa like of of Jonathan LaFay and and Abigail and stuff and it's it's really like he puts a lot of thought into his albums and the concepts behind his albums. Yeah, and I mean that's why it takes a while to get some of the albums out too, but they're yes, but they're very well worth it. He's, mm -hmm. he's I mean he's he's an unbelievable musician. Yes. Um. Of course, we have to talk about a little bit, obviously, you know, uh, he started out in various metal bands in, uh, and, and hard rock bands in, in uh, Denmark. Um, yeah, in the 70s. So he's been yeah. going for a while, King Diamond. Yes. Yeah, in the, se in the early 70s he started. Um, Black Rose is probably one of, uh, besides Merciful Fate and, and King Diamond, Black Rose is probably his other, like, biggest claim to fame i would say because they actually released like a, an album like there was like an album of just like sessions that they did it wasn't even like an actual album it was basically just like demos um but it, that was pretty good too king when he was with black rose and again he had that same vocal style he wasn't doing the falsetto as much back then but he was you know it was very similar vocal style yeah he and was then starting to shape this persona that would become king diamond essentially when yes he was doing it and then, of course, in 1980, uh, he formed Merciful Fate, um, which is, you know, again, one of the most popular bands of that period of metal. Um, it's considered one of the, you know, the founders. They call it first wave black metal, even though that I, I that I, has always kind of bothered me considering it black metal because, I mean, I know it's like Venom, Merciful Fate, and... Um, who was it? Uh, Bathory are considered the first wave of black metal, 
And I think Merciful Fate got it just for, like, the imagery and the lyrical content, but not really the sound, because it's really not yeah, black metal stand. Is not anything close to what it would become. I mean, Ven- I mean you could say that for, like, mo- for, like... Even Venom is not Venom. I would say that for Venom, I would say I would say Bathory. I think Bathory. Bathory is the closest because yeah, it was Bathory's just really low quality thrash metal, pretty much. Because like uh, Quorthon was just doing it in his basement, pretty much. So he was just making thrash records in his friggin' parents' basement, and that's why it was so low quality. And that kind of became like the the black metal sound going a lot on later into the eighties. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, um, meanwhile. Um, Venom was just like a lot more. It was, just, it was just like, it was more or less just like a heavier Motorhead. It was a lot closer yeah. to thrash metal than it was to anything black metal. Like, even, yeah. like the only thing that it was, the only thing that it would take is just like the satanic like, lyrical content, really. Yeah, um, I, I would say more. I guess the fate. cardboard drums too. Yeah. Like the- um. The drums were not made out of cardboard. Before. They it just sounded like, like don't know. They just sounded like cardboard because the quality was very low. Yeah. Merciful Fate was uh, way better quality. Uh, you know, it, it was decent, like, production values. But the sound-wise, it was more like, I would say, new wave of British heavy metal. Even though it wasn't British and it wasn't really during the same time period. It was a little bit after the new wave of British heavy metal. Which was, of course, was the late seventies, early eighties, where Iron Maiden, and you know Motorhead, and around the same time, later Judas Priest. Yeah, but that was more like the early eighties. Uh, Melissa didn't come out until what nineteen eighty five, I think. Yeah, or eighty four. Yeah, and Don't Break the Oath came out in eight. No, Don't Break the Oath was eighty four. Um, oh, Melissa came out in eighty three. Don't Break the Oath was eighty four. Yeah, so that one, I that one I should know because I have a Don't Break the Oath tattoo on my arm. Yeah. Both great albums. Uh, I mean, uh, Merciful Fate is an amazing band. And basically what King Diamond did was he, when Merciful Fate broke up, he really kind of just continued Merciful Fate, except only as his solo career. So uh, basically what happened was uh, uh, Michael Denner and Tim Timmy Hansen uh, joined him and they formed the King Diamond Band and then basically just kept you know, playing, and uh, he got a couple other musicians, and, and they started doing their own thing, and it, it was very slow, and then Merciful Fate reformed and, and disbanded a couple times again after that, and I don't think there was ever any bad blood, it wasn't like, it wasn't like Ozzy leaving Black Sabbath, getting fired for Black Sabbath, and doing his own, like, solo career just to, like, say, screw you to those guys, you know, and, and it was it was more like okay this project's done let's go do something else kind of yeah, you know it seemed much more mutual and I mean when King Diamond well, like when, when when King Diamond went to go do his own thing like like you said um, Hanson and Denner ended up just like you know going with him to do King Diamond anyway so it wasn't like it didn't so there wasn't really any bad blood it was just like hey yeah you know like you said hey um, this looks like it's done. Uh, do we want to keep doing this? No, not really. All right. Well, I kind of want to keep doing stuff. So, like, if you guys want to do it, then, like, come with me. Yeah, sure, we'll do it. And then, like, that's just how it was. So it was, like, his new band, but, be- but like, he was using the name of the persona that he built in Merciful Fate. Yeah. I would also say that... Which I um, think was a smart choice, too. Uh, King Diamond's sound also was a little bit different than Merciful Fate in that... Merciful Fate, the, at least the first two albums, the songs were a little bit slower. It wasn't as much of that, like, new wave of British heavy metal style with the high-tempo, like, you know, thrashier songs. Um, I think King Diamond, his solo career, it became a little bit faster. Like, the tempos became faster, became more uh, power metal-ish, I would say. Because it's not really thrash metal, it's more no, power it's metal. it's a more power metal. I mean, and he utilized a lot more of, like, keyboard. He used a lot more, like, keyboards, mm-hmm. and he used a lot more, like, ambiance. Yes. Like, aura to just kind of help bring the stories to life in um, in King Diamond. So, like, King Diamond, I guess he had a little... I, I guess there was a little bit more artistic freedom, although Merciful Fate, it was very similar to it. This is just kind of more of, like, the natural progression of Merciful Fate. Because if you listen to Merciful yeah. Fate... And then you listen to King Diamond, it's it's a seamless transition. Like, there isn't any, oh, well, what happened there? Like, there's never, there, like, you never have to think about, 
how one turned into the other. It's just like, oh yeah, that that it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So I feel I, I feel like he definitely knew that there was something to the Merciful Fate style, and that this was worth continuing, which obviously it paid off. But this was but he clearly felt that this style was worth continuing and that's what became the king diamond band so i also liked i i i think that's probably the best decision that he made was to make it a continuation because a lot of times when people go and do their own thing and they do their own solo project it either sounds very different from what they were known for doing or it's just not as good and they're like trying to do it or anything but like this is more of like but him choosing to do a continuation was like I thought was really great because this was mm-hmm. probably where Merciful Fate was headed anyway. Yeah, and I, I, there's a similar progression I think there with Ozzy leaving Black Sabbath and doing his solo career. Except I think Ozzy became a little bit more commercial when he left Black Sabbath. Like yeah, I would say so. It wasn't as heavy, but the songs were faster. I, I don't know. It's hard, you know. It's, it's Later on, maybe the first two albums, like Diary of a Madman, or uh, Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman, were like more heavier metal, and then he got kind of a little bit more commercial after that, after Randy passed away. Um, but like, I feel like King Diamond kind of stayed more towards the like art over commercialism kind of aspect. Like he, you know, did more what he wanted to do rather than making like music that everybody wanted to hear. He kind of like wanted to make music that he liked. Oh, for sure, and. And I think that was, you know, it's mentioned that's one of one of the big points of why Merciful Fate broke up in the first place is because Hank Sherman wanted to move Merciful Fate into a more commercial direction, and King Diamond didn't. Um, he wanted to stay onto the, like, you know, that traditional, like, 70s heavy metal style with the, like, satanic and witchcraft lyrics. And and so I, I think that's kind of what he did when he formed King Diamond, is he just continued with that, with the concepts. So re- really, if, if, if Merciful Fate had stayed together, they probably, like, Abigail probably would have been a Merciful Fate album, you know, like... Yeah, uh, But I think it, that would have came, I think that would have come later. I think if, I think if Merciful Fate... Yes. I think if Merciful Fate stayed together, I think most of the King Diamond albums would have happened under that banner, but I don't think that they would have happened in the same year. I think they would have... No. Happened, I think... I think that evolution would have taken place a little bit later than it did with King Diamond just going into his stuff. So, right. Like, it would have been a little bit more commercial for maybe another album or two, and then maybe we would have started to, like, see little shifts. Yes. Or maybe they would have only had, like, one or two concept albums. Like, I really don't know. That's true, too. You know, you know, you don't know how the influence of the other band members would have been, and, you know, if King Diamond would have ended up, like, wanting to do more concept albums or less, because, you know, if, you know, if nobody else really was into it, you know, you obviously have to, like, have some kind of cohesion in the band and stuff. So, uh, who knows, maybe he would have just done his solo thing no matter what, you know, if he wanted to do more of the concept albums. Right, um, that's which, you know, that's possible, too. I mean, he could have just, like, done his own project anyway. Like, yeah. at some point, so I really don't know. And he could have just juggled the two bands here and there. But another thing about King Diamond is, like, he is extremely theatrical. So, mm-hmm. like, so when you see his shows, it's like, he really pulls you into this world, and there's, like, a whole, like, elaborate stage setting, and he uses, like, him and the band members, they use every inch of that stage. They're walking around on, like, the platforms. There's all kinds of, like, things coming out. There's, like, road crew like, coming out dressed up as, like, his grandma or, like, a priest or, like, you know, mm-hmm. an asylum or, like, an asylum person or, you know, there's dancers sometimes. There's, like, all these kinds of things. And, yes. And it's it's extremely entertaining. Um, you and I saw him with, um, with Exodus when he finally did his comeback tour, like... Yes. When was this, like, six years ago, maybe? No, it wasn't that long ago. I think it was 2016 or 2017. That's I'm pretty sure. I it was pretty recent. I mean, that's still recent is still four years if it's well, yeah. It was probably like 2016 or 2015. I, don't, I, I don't want to say 16. 
It, it was pretty recently. It wasn't like ten years ago. It was it was within the last five years, I would say. Um, but, that, but yeah, that was. I mean, it was a great show, and and I was honestly surprised at how good he still sounds singing, even this. Like, and he had some health, major health problems in yes. the in the early two thousands or twenty tens. Yes, I was a when uh, he was supposed to come in two thousand and nine, I think. Um, yeah, he was supposed to come in 2009 and then he, um, he, it turned out that he needed heart surgery and his heart mm -hmm. surgery was, well, what he needed was actually a lot more than he expected. Uh, in fact, turned out to be a triple bypass. So yeah. He, um, and he had to cancel the tour and it was going to be him creator and, um, and some other band called Celador. I don't know who they were, but I think that they were like an up and coming thrash band that, ended up not really doing anything after that tour got canceled um mm -hmm. and king Di and uh, and creator ended up coming out with hordes of chaos from that i think yeah um i i i had tickets to it actually it was supposed to be at bb kings and i remember how bummed out with that we were and then uh we just exchanged the tickets i think for um for exodus we had tickets to that we had tickets for tanker too and um tanker couldn't come because that was the year where like every European band had, like, visa problems at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I never got to see Tankard. But, um, but, uh, King, but he ended up having to go on the shelf for a much longer time, and he ended up, yeah. King Diamond, years. not do it, yeah, for, like, many years. I yeah, it was, like, two or three years that he was, like, basically not doing anything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was obviously... There was some like fear that he was not going to make it and stuff because uh, we had lost a couple other like rock legends at that time. You know, obviously Dio had passed away yeah, around Pete, that time. And then Pete, Pete Steele, Steele. Him yeah, two before. Yeah, so you know, it was like we were kind of like up in the air. It's like, okay, you know, is is King Diamond going to survive this? I really hope he does because, like, you know, I I wanted to see him live. I had never seen him live, obviously. Yeah, I me too. So I'm really glad that he did actually pull through and he, you know, got healthy again. And like I said, it, it, it was really good. Like his show, he, he, he did a great job. Like he was a really good singer still, which, yeah. you know, you find a lot of the older guys, like they really can't sing. And there's only a couple that I've said like, okay, they're actually like almost as good as they used to be. And that's King Diamond and surprisingly Ozzy was when I saw Ozzy with Black Sabbath, I was like, holy crap. He actually yeah, was, sounds really good. Yeah, that was <laughs> I was like, show. I'm, I was surprised too, because yeah. Ozzy had been like on and off over yeah. the time. Like, like there had been like years where he was terrible, and there had been other years like the one that we were fortunate enough to see where he was great. It's when he's sober is when he's good. I think yeah. when he's drinking, when he's off the wagon, he's like not as good. He he gets sloppy and he just it doesn't practice and stuff. But he's when he's sober, he's good. And I think that's that's why he was sober during that Black Sabbath tour. Mm. Um. But, uh, yeah, so that King Diamond show was amazing, and they played, which, this was a cool thing, and this is what I, I like, and this doesn't really happen a lot with metal bands, because not a lot of metal bands do concept albums, is that they played the entire album of Abigail yeah, live, that was and, great. you know, they had a little bit in the beginning and a little bit at the end that they played some, you know, others, like, he played a couple of Merciful Fate songs, obviously, like, you know, he plays Melissa because that's like one of their, you know, signature songs. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, he had like an intermission. He basically did two sets because it was like yeah. the whole Abigail album, which is about an hour. Mm -hmm. and he did like twenty to thirty minutes of Merciful Fate songs. Yeah. Um. And but it's cool because you know we got to actually see and the stage show for it was really cool and actually there was like like things acted out. Yeah, you know that for that were in the song, like you know, like with the slippery stairs and stuff like that. You know, like yeah, so that that's the kind of thing that you don't really see a lot in a metal act. Like, there's a couple of like the theatr more theatrical metal acts, like you know Rob Zombie and Alice Cooper and stuff like that. But it's not as common in heavy also, metal as it is in other not as genres of rock. King, it's also not as theatrical as King Diamond. As King Diamond, you're getting no. like, a whole like vaudevillian thing. You're getting a whole yes. Like, cohesive storyline throughout the, the throughout the show i almost called it a play just now um yeah but like uh king diamond was the last show that i saw before um before covid and lockdown and everything i saw him in uh, I, i've said this on the show before but the last show that i saw before everything went to hell was um was 
around this time two years ago. Uh, like, yeah. I think it was like Hollow Weekend or something. Like It was like around Halloween mm-hmm. 19. Um, and I went to go see it at the King's Theater uh, with my friend Gianni, who, like, you know, which the King's Theater, like, like I've said before, is in the most unlikely place in New York to see a metal show. It's in, like, a big, like, um, like, it, it's in, like, it's in the middle of, like, like around like Flatbush Avenue or something, um, which is like a very like uh, Caribbean area. Mm. So it's like so so you've got like Haitians and Jamaicans and like whatever and like Guyanese people around the area for the most part, and it's and it was like the most unlikely thing. And like we were all like you know we were we went to go get a gyro or something before the show, and and they were and and they were just like. And like somebody was like, why? And somebody was just like, why are all the white people around here? And we were like, oh, it's a metal show. And we and they were like, oh, you guys like that? And like, yeah, we're going. We we, we like that. And we're like, they're like, oh, do they like sacrifice children or whatever on stage? And we're like, no, that's not what happens. Well, I mean, <laughs> they kind of do it this at the one we're seeing, but it's a but it's a doll. Um, you know what? Better. You know what? Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> And then we just went off to the show and we had a great time and it was the perfect place for that kind of show because like the King's Theater is this like old vaudevillian theater and like they even get the staff to dress up in like the red bellhop uniforms and whatever and it's very cool. It's like stuck into a time booth and it has like, you know, that it has that old like theater stage. They didn't really change anything except they like gutted, um, they just like gutted the front like 10 rows or something for like um for um for or like the orchestra pit they just kind of like gutted it so that the ga people can just stand there but it's freaking great what a wonderful yeah. venue i hope it's still around and i hope that now that we're starting to get shows again i hope that it can happen soon although i'm i'm not really ready yet to start going to like a big show or anything mm-hmm. it metal or otherwise um I guess maybe when the booster comes out, I'll probably go. But he was phenomenal. He was promoting the new album, uh, The Institute, which is just about, like, um, just about, like, a, a mental asylum and, like, a bunch of, like, the things going on in there that are, like, you know, super spooky and whatnot. But it was a great friggin' show, and it was just a lot of, it was just, it was if that's the last show that I ever see, I would be happy. I also have another story about my Merciful Fate tattoo. Um... Uh, when I, I, I was doing an interview with Obituary um, a few years ago, and there was a show with them, Exhumed and King Diamond. It was a great freaking show. Uh, I think it was at... God, where was it? Um, not Irving. It was at Gramercy Theater. And it was like the day before Superstorm Sandy like wiped out like New York for a couple of days. Uh-huh. And that... Uh, and, that was a lot of fun. I was talking to John Tardy and like, and um, and we were just like watching his band, like we were watching the sound check guys like do sound check, like and we were just sitting at like the top of like uh, just at the top of the seats, and I was just kind of like, hey man, did you think you ever think in like thirty years from now, I get to watch people setting up my rig? But he's like, no, this is this is kind of surreal, and it, it was a cool moment, um, but yeah. backstage was way cooler. I was hanging out with um, Exhumed, and Vector played that show, too. Oh, wow. Uh, I forgot about that. Um, yeah, I was hanging out with Exhumed and Vector in the other room. The only guys that I didn't meet were the uh, were the Napalm Death guys. I said hello to Shane really quick, but that was about it. I didn't really have a real conversation, um, but like, we were just hanging out, and, we, and then, like, um, the bass player from Exhumed notices the Merciful Fate tattoo, and he's like, "He's like, is that Melissa?" And I'm like, "No, it's Don't Break the Oath." And I picked up my, I picked up my my sleeve a little bit. And he was uh-huh. like, "Okay," and he like takes his shirt off, and he has a mer- he has um he has a Melissa tattoo on his chest. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's fucking great, man. Um, that's pretty so, awesome. Yeah, so like he comes in like a few minutes later, and um, we start it with like. With like a thirty rack of like uh, of like cores, and uh-huh. um, and like me, Exhumed guys and Vector were just like we're just talking about King Diamond and we're singing King Diamond songs and we're just drinking beer. Nice. It was a great freaking time. Yeah. Um, and, the, and then the show and then Vector was like, 
oh, crap, we have to get ready. So then I was like, okay, I want to see you guys, but this has been, you know, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, King Diamond brings people together, and it's... Oh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to share a little bit of our past. as When we start, first started, well, it was Zamboni then. We can't say that, though, because of the lawyers. <laughs> when we first started our band back in the day, and, you know, you would come up on, like, a Sunday afternoon, and, like... You know, we 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 live pretty far away from each other. We're not gonna. I'm not gonna divulge necessarily too many details so people yes, don't freaking live, track us down. We live but, on opposite ends of parts unknown. We'll put it that yeah, way. Yeah. So, you know, Chris would come up for like a weekend and we would rehearse, and then I'd drive him back down, and uh, we would friggin' blast King Diamond and like just like sing friggin' Abigail at the top of our lungs like the whole way home. <laughs> like it was like you know back when this is like when we first first started way back. Like in 2010, you know, yeah. this is like we, we were just starting to like write songs and and we hadn't even like recorded anything yet and we're pl- let alone played anything live. And that was just what we did. We would like pl- come up to my house in my garage, friggin' rehearse. Then I would drive Chris home and we would blast King Diamond. God, it's so crazy that it's 10 years, that it's been like 11 years. 11 years. 11 since we've... Freaking years. That's nuts. Um, yeah. I mean, well, you know what? What a sur- not a surprise. Actually, it's kind of makes sense that that, that the band's ten year anniversary would have happened during a pandemic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's just <laughs> that's, the curse of Lord Petrus right there. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> which that's a whole different thing altogether. The curse of Lord Petrus is basically Lord Petrus is like Peter Steele's ghost, basically from Typo Negative. Um, we would listen to. Um, um, it was because we named the mascot at the time Zamboni Pete, which was just like a big zombie that like bore some resemblance to like Peter Steele, which just meant being tall and having black long hair. Um, yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing else really like striking about the appearance. But anyway, we named it that, and um, we, that's what we named the mascot that we had. And um, he's on everything that we've ever done, except for, like, the live album, I think. Uh, and- he wasn't on... Well, because we changed the mascot for the... the remember, because of... The, be, because of the curse, we changed the yeah. mascot a little bit. A so, little bit, but we didn't give him a new name or anything. We just... No. Like, so, was- yeah, so I guess he wasn't really... Yeah. Yeah, so I, so then we really it was yeah I guess he wasn't old, he was on everything besides the live album. Yeah, and um, yeah, yeah, so we had him there, and oh no, he's not on the he's not on the sucks EP. Oh, okay, that's right because it looks like graffiti. Um, yeah, you know, we had we, we had an EP called Zamboni Sucks. It just like it's just called Sucks, the stupid EP, and it is stupid and it does suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that nuclear hatred on bandcamp that bandcamp.com or just on wherever your musical platforms are you can find it there anyway um so whenever like something bad happened like typo negative or carnivore would be the would be the first song to show up whenever like what yeah. like at whatever happened yeah like, right after a typo negative song or a carnivore song would show up so that's where the curse was of Lord Petrus. Yep. Yeah, we would have like, oh, rehearsal? Oh, guess what? The drummer needs has to work. He got called into work. There goes the friggin' typo negative song or or the or yeah, carnivore song. Number one, just right away. Yeah. You know, or you know, oh it, the Oh, our our new drummer, our new drummer's grandma's sick. Guess what's playing on the radio? Typo negative or it, carnivore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it was, so it became, like, literally a cur- the curse of Lord Petrus, and it was real. So... Yeah, don't, don't so, ever let anybody tell you that curses aren't real. So Lord Petrus is responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. Probably. Because nuclear hatred was not allowed to have a, a, a 10-year anniversary show. Nope. Nope, nope. <laughs> oh, so... King Diamond. Yeah. He just puts so, a tremendous show, and like just everything is unbelievable that he does. Yeah. Um. Also, his boys can swim. He's got a five-year-old son, and he's like sixty-something, isn't he? Yeah. 
Okay. Pretty perfect. <laughs> Jim Bendix Peterson, age 65. He can retire officially. Wow. Yeah, 1956, June 14th. It was that, that, that was his birthday. And, yeah, he's got a five-year-old. He's got the goods. I, I think uh, King Diamond really... It, he. I, mean, I think his wife is also much younger than him. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, probably. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, he's got this, it, he's in this unique position, I think, King Diamond, that, like, he's so well-known in the metal and rock world, but, like, kind of not well-known in, like, ma more mainstream rock. It's, it's like, this weird thing, because it's, like, you know, if you ask anybody who's, like, a metalhead, like, oh, you know, who are, like, the, the godfathers of heavy metal? And King Diamond is definitely on that list, you know, along with, with Ozzy and, and Rob Halford and, you know, all that, like... But, like, he's not, like, so mainstream that, like, all these, like, mainstream fans know who he is or what Merciful Fate is or anything. It's, like, this weird kind of, like, niche that he's found himself in where he's, like, you know, uh, plenty successful and has made, like, tons of money and, and had a great career. But isn't, like, you know, stuck, you know, like, catering to the masses because he doesn't have to. Yeah, I mean, and he was probably smart with his money, too. I'm sure he was. I wouldn't be surprised if he owns the Masters. Yeah, and I it doesn't really. I don't think he was like one to like do like a lot of hard drugs or alcohol or anything like that. Um, I mean, you know, I don't know. He's he's very private. Yeah, yeah. He's he's not a very public person. He's not like a rock star that like he has to flaunt everything he does. You know, he he basically just goes on tour, does his thing, goes home. Like you know, at the end of the day, um, yeah, basically. Actually, I actually, like, found out yesterday, you know, was it yesterday or today? I don't know. I was reading about Gary Holt, and, like, somebody asked him about, um, about, like, what he thought that, um, like, what he thought was, like, the reason why Exodus didn't, like, get as, um, as big as, the, as, like, the other four thrash bands, and he just said, he was like, oh, we had, like, some, we, his exact quote was, like, Something, it was like, we made, like, bad choices, like, our behavioral choices were not great when we uh -huh. were younger, and, like, the guy was like, what does that mean? And he was like, oh, meth. <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, wait, what? Like, I, 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 I Well, I mean, I could see friggin', uh, um, uh, fucking, what's his face? Paul Bailoff Bailoff. doing meth. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, but, like, not all of them like but, no but then in the interview gary holt's like yeah we were all on meth except for like jack gibson so like four out of five he was he's like listen when four-fifths of your band is on meth then like this is gonna happen yeah yeah i could see jack gibson he seems like just like the chillest dude and then it just like just shows up to play bass and then goes home like yeah probably it's it's just interesting. That, it's funny. But I was just like not expecting like meth to be an issue. Yeah. And and he's just like, oh, you know, when you're tweaking. Well, again, like it's like like you Paul, have a lot of fun things. I'm like, I, I, I'm like okay, I, I don't think so, but all right, if, if you had. Yeah, there's really you think about it. There's not really that many bands that do meth. <laughs> no. Like, even, like, the hardest drugs usually are, like, heroin. Like, that's, and fucking, that's, like, of course, Megadeth, you know, like, yeah, because was well-known. And Coke, Coke is pretty popular in, in... Yeah, Coke is quite popular in, um... In but movies. meth, like, that's extreme. Yeah, no. Well, I guess that goes to show you, that's why Exodus was never, you know, you know, any bigger than they, you know, were. Mm, I mean, that and they also, like... They they stayed pure, which during the nineties there wasn't really like in the nineties there wasn't really anything that you could do if you like stayed a pure thrash band. It was a weird time. From yeah. Nineties to the, like the early two th the to the mid two thousands. It was like if you were just a pure thrash band for whatever reason you were like dead in the water. I don't know why. Um, I think thrash was just not. It was not unique and it was too rigid in how it was structured like if you were a thrash band and you didn't want to like explore other sounds at all like you were just kind of like screwed because that was like it got boring after a while like there's only so many riffs you can do with you know in e minor 
<laughs> basically, you know, yeah, with, with like open open E friggin' string, you know, just chugging on the open E. So yeah, I think we're, we're also like the big four bands. They didn't like they kept their sound, but like they experimented a little bit, and I think that yes. kind of helped their stay their longevity too. Like Metallica. Well. Like, yeah, I mean, and you could say like, oh, they sold out or whatever, but and that's fine. But yeah, there were so bands that like those albums, but they, but like, you still knew it was them when you listened to it. Yes, just, like whether or not you liked it is like, you know, that's that's your side of the story. But well, and and you, you could say like, okay, if you want to argue that they sold out, whatever. But there are plenty of bands that were successful, like that didn't sell sell out, like like Death. You know, yeah. when Sound of Perseverance came out, like, that was a completely, like, over-the-top, amazing album, and, like, not any kind... They didn't compromise their sound at all, but they, no. like, changed it. They evolved with the times. It was, like... It became, like, a prog metal album, almost, you know? And, like, you you listen to, to Spiritual Hero, Healing next to Sound of Perseverance, and you would think it's two completely separate bands, you know? Yeah. Because even, I mean, Chuck Schuldner even changed his vocal style for that album, but it's, like, it's so good. Like, it's such a great album. So, like, from, like, a musical standpoint, not just, like, a commercial standpoint. Like, so I, I think it's a sign that, like, you know, it wasn't necessarily, like, keeping to the old ways and, like, oh, you had to, like, oh, you're not true if you don't, like, play only thrash metal. It's, like, no, you could have changed your sound and evolved your sound a little bit and still been successful and not compromised your artistic vision also and and death is like the perfect example of that but well there's a, let's be, well, there, there's a difference between evolving your sound and just experimenting yeah because if you're well i i agree I, I that, say, that's true too i would say what metallica did was was experimentation because they saw that like thrash wasn't really selling anymore and also they mm -hmm. you know the big wigs in their ear who were probably like you know having their input and they were having their own like struggles with like substances anyway at the time yeah um, but like they were just kind of doing a lot more experimentation and like kirk was like in his weird art phase mm -hmm. like he was really experimenting um and so like experimentation is it's good to do but sometimes like you want to save an experiment for like solo stuff um yeah but like but they still kept, but like you could still tell that it was Metallica. Whereas like Death, you it, like it had evolved. Like you were yes. like as like if you listened, like if you were listening to each album, it slowly got more and more progressive. Yes, I would say even I would say starting with Spiritual Heal, right? The Spiritual Healing after um after Leprosy. Yes. Yeah, I think it was because that was when the logo went from being an invert. That was when the T went from being an inverted cross to a regular cross, I think. And the logo. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it went for, so like spiritual healing you could start to see some of the progressiveness taking shape and then and then as you and then if you listen to it like in a linear approach, you could like you be like oh yeah this is totally what happened with this band like this to mm -hmm. whole, like like ever like when a band like when the sound when, when a band evolves and when the and when the sound evolves it makes sense when it's experimentation you can still tell that it's the same band but you just but if you listen to like but if you but if you're listening to it linear you're still gonna go well what the hell happened there yeah well and it, it's kind of weird to, like, you know, Metallica experimented with blues a lot with Unload and Reload. And, like, people are pissed off about that. But it's, like, heavy yeah. metal is blues. It like, is. it started as blues. Like, Black Sabbath was a blues band. And the only reason they got the sound they wanted, or the sound that they had, is because literally it was, like, basically a pure accident. Because Tony Iommi friggin' had his fingers chopped off and had to down-tune his guitar to make it more comfortable to play. You know? Right. And and that just basically really created a... that dark sound, but they were really just a blues band playing like, you know, bluesy rock music and that you know, the the heavier distortion and the fact that they downtuned is what created the, like the 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 heavy metal sound. 
Right. So, I like, mean, they were called Earth before yes. this happened. They were called Earth. And then, mm -hmm. like, you know, he quits his job at the factory to go become a musician. And then, you know, last day on the job, he, like, cuts the fingertips off by accident on the sheet metal machine. And he, um, and, you know, and, like, he's playing and he's tuning low. And they're like, well, there ain't no way that we could call the band Earth anymore. So mm -hmm. we have to, like, we have, like, this sound is way darker, so we have to we have to change the name to like fit the sound. Otherwise, right. it's otherwise no one's gonna understand it. Like they got the business end of that, whether they were trying to do it or not. They got they understood like the business and marketing element of it before anyone else even like even knew what because before they even knew what they were doing. They got that part of it. Yeah. Well, even and even if you listen to like doom metal now, like modern doom metal, even is still basically just heavy blues. Okay. You know, the 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 heavy metal like Black Sabbath, the song Black Sabbath, which like let's argue it's the first heavy true heavy metal song ever written. Okay, is is literally centered around the tritone, the blue note. Like that's that's the whole the riff is is just literally a blues riff, just slowed down really. And like really like played like darkly and stuff like that without resolving. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I guess I I could see why people gave Metallica flack because obviously they were selling a lot of records, and you know, people get pissed off when metal bands sell a lot of records because you know, oh, you're not truly, you're not, you know, metal has this like kind of uh, roots in like you know underground you know, punk rock almost music where it's like very like art matters more than commercial, you know, making money and stuff like that. But so, I, you know, I could see why people got pissed off when Metallica did that because they, it, it, I could see why it was considered selling out. But if anything, I would say the Black Album was more them selling out rather than Load and Reload because Load and Reload, they really were experimenting with different genres like blues and, and a little bit of country and stuff like that, which again, so you can say what you want. That wasn't really... There was no metal bands really doing that at that point. So... Right. At least not to the extent that they did it. You know, they, they really completely reinvented their sound. So, you know... And and were they good albums? Not... They weren't the greatest, you know? I think you could take the best songs from both Load and Reload and just make it one album. Like, I didn't think it needed to be a double album the way it was. There's a lot of filler that's not that good. Yeah. I would say most of those albums are not very good, but they have bright spots. Yes. Yeah. They there's there, you could take if you took the like the five best songs from each album and then put them onto one album, it would have been a decent album. But yeah, they I, like I, wrote I like thirty it. songs, or like oh, let's not like actually like quality control this. Let's just put every single one out on a double album because because friggin' Bob Rock says it'd be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that 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 guy's an idiot. But what are you gonna do? You, yeah. But but it, someone who really didn't have this problem, I think, was uh, like we said, King Diamond, because he kind of <laughs> stayed in his own. I was wondering how we were gonna get back into it. Um, Metallica did. Only he really King Diamond too. Oh yeah, they well Metallica played. Um, they they had that you know on Garage the Garage Inc album, which was their covers album. They did Merciful Faith. Which was a it was a it, uh, a it was like a compilation of a bunch of Merciful Fate songs, yeah. And um, they played live with King Diamond, I believe, at I want to say I want to say Ozfest. Yeah, it was the one day in Texas Ozfest that they did, mm -hmm. where Realm where and, Mortis ended up where Rig Mortis opened. Actually, um, when, uh, once upon a time I worked at a Sam Ash, and I've pro and I've mentioned this before. Um, that, well, not this particular story, but I worked there and like they're like, um, we went on a big business trip to Atlantic City where like Yamaha was like they paid for everything and they like got us absolutely hammered, um, and they also did some product knowledge too during the day, which was nice of them. Um, we uh, one of the guys there, um, his name's also Chris, but I forget what his last name is. Anyway, he, he's, he's he's a nice guy. I don't know if he still works there or not. This was. A, this was like six years ago or something, but he um, he was working for Gibson at the time, and uh, Mike Skasha, 
who was the guitarist of Rigor Mortis and uh, Ministry. Um, he's no longer with us, uh, but Mike Skasha was uh, endorsed by Gibson. And um, for the OzFest show, um, he needed a road crew guy, so, like, Gibson sent him. So like this, so like this guy that I was talking with at the thing, he um, he was Mike Scotch's like techie for a day, and uh -huh. I was like, you know, what was that like, man? And he was like, I have never seen anybody, I I I couldn't see his hands move. He was so fast, like I couldn't. He's like, I, I saw a sound coming out of his guitar, so I knew it was working, but uh -huh. his hand, I never saw it move. And like a lot of, and like he plays all over the fretboard. He's like, I never saw his hand move. Wow. So it was just that fast. Yeah, he was unbelievably yeah. fast. Yeah. <sighs> but yes, King Diamond was at that show, and that was actually he only came out for that appearance. Um, and that was like his way of saying I'm back. And also, King Diamond lives in Dallas, so like it was probably. Oh, really? I didn't know that he lived in Dallas. Yeah, he lives in like he lives around like maybe closer to Fort Worth area. Oh wow! But, um, yeah, he lives right around there. When I was hanging out with um, with Ben from Incinerator and the Antichrist, we um, he actually like apparently doesn't live too far from the record store where I got my Frank Zappa records. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and at one point in time, he lived next to he lived like next door to a priest or a pastor or something, and he would just like look at him funny when he was taking out the garbage, and he would always like he like he always just tried to like he always tried to like spook the priest. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, now he's just got a his five year old son and his wife, and that's going great, and he's still got the band and stuff. But King Diamonds, uh, but. To, well, like while we're on the subject of sounds, like it's it would be a crime to talk about King Diamond and not mention the other musicians in his band because it's not the music isn't just good because King Diamond is a good singer and he experiments and he does all these things and he's uh -huh. all over the place with his music and it's structured well. The actual musicians are like unbelievable. Phenomenal, yeah. Like, Andy Lark is one of the greatest guitarists of all times. Uh, he's my favorite guitarist. Yeah. I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone, except I, I, I guess maybe like Randy Rhodes in his prime, which mm -hmm. like, you know, that's all that he was, was in his prime when we, when we lost him. I don't yeah. think anyone else could hold a candle to Andy LaRock. He's just, he's unbelievably gifted. And when he plays... Yes. It sounds like there's eight other guitar players playing, like, in harmony with him. Like, yeah. he's basically a one-man Iron Maiden. Yeah. Yeah, he's a really, like, the master of, of, like, melodic guitar playing. Yeah, and um, he had a brief stint in death. He played on individual thought patterns, which... Yes. The lineup on that album is just a super group all together. Yeah. Well, I mean, Death always had like, gr like great lineups. I mean, friggin', you had friggin' Gene Hoagland in Death, you yeah, know, uh, Richard Christie, like, yeah. yeah. So that that you know, obviously, like that really is like, and yeah, Steve DiGiorgio on bass, like, yeah, you there's there was nothing that was yeah to stop that lineup. No, and, and yeah, that's. They should see that would be if I mean I know they were doing that death to all thing. If they had another band, I mean they would have to get someone else on vocals, obviously. But get Andy Laroque, Steve DiGiorgio, and Gene Hoagland in a band together again, you know? Oh God, I would love to see that. That would be amazing. Yeah, I would love. I mean, to see that. King Diamond on vocals. There you go. It would yeah, be amazing. Just, just do that. I mean, that's basically. Yeah, that's that would just be unbelievable. Um, but. King Diamond's been, like, they've just always been, they've always been fantastic. Like, Snowy Shaw was a wonderful player. Um, they've, uh, they also had Mickey D, who was the best drummer that they had mm -hmm. ever. And King Diamond has said this, too, where, like, Mickey D went on to, uh, to play in Motorhead. Um, like, uh, I, I forget when exactly, but he left, he left to go join Motorhead, um, 
I think after like 1988 or something like that, he went to he went to go join Motorhead and he stayed there until un, until Lemmy passed. Mm-hmm. Which I, I still can't believe that that guy's gone. Um, I thought he that, yeah, that was a tragedy. I thought he would have lived forever. Um, yeah, but anyway, Mickey D was unbelievable, and like King Diamond has even said in interviews, you know, not for nothing, we've had some great drummers, but we've never had anybody as good as Mickey D. Yeah. Like, just just unbelievable band. Like, all of his players are just, they're incredibly gifted. Um, and, oh, this actually gives me another story. So, like, Charlie D'Angelo, um, I don't know if he still does, but he was the bass player for Merciful Fate when the, uh, when Merciful Fate reunited. Um, he, uh, Charlie D'Angelo... He either still is or once was the uh, bass player also for Arch Enemy. Um, really? That's interesting. Yeah, so one of the first... I, 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 I kick myself for this. I was thinking about this the other day. Um, one of the first shows that I went to was, I believe, to see Arch Enemy and Machine Head. And uh, my friend T, uh, my Biffle T, she, um, she took me... She, she, she got me tickets to this show where we went to this show or something... And we hadn't really seen each other in a very, very long time. And we're in front of the Starbucks. Um, I think I had to use the bathroom after coming out of the train. And, like, I, I went into Starbucks and I bought... And I, like, stayed in line to buy something so I could get the bathroom coat or whatever. And I leave. And then there's this, like, you know, eight-foot-tall guy or whatever with <laughs> long hair just standing outside the Starbucks. And I'm like... And we both saw him and we like, were like, oh, crap, that's somebody... And, like from Arch Enemy, and I was, and I walked over, and I was, and I was like, "Oh my God, dude, it's you!" And then he, he was like, you know, "I'm like, we're here to see you guys play tonight." He's like, "It's like, oh, how'd you guess I was in the band?" And we're like, "I mean, what other eight foot tall Swedish person is going to be in New York City right now?" And he was like, "Okay, well, you got me there." So I'm on the phone with somebody, and so so somebody calls me, and I'm like, "Oh." I'm like, oh, dude, I, yeah, I'll be there in a minute. Listen, I just got, I just got to hang out with Chris Amott. <laughs> and Chris Amott is the guitar player who is like a foot shorter than this guy. <laughs> and he just kind of had this look on his face like, oh, God damn it, not again. And like, and I didn't realize this until like a long time, until like maybe a year later. And I was like, wow, what a jackass. <laughs> So yeah, that's my experience there with uh, with anything close to a King Diamond representative. Uh, God, I was maybe like fourteen or fifteen. I was oh wow! Really dumb. No, not no, I'm sorry, I wasn't that young. I was like eighteen. Okay, still pretty stupid. That's still pretty. Yeah, <laughs> pretty young. Pretty, still pretty stupid. I should have known better, but anyway. Oh, well, it happens. Yeah, it's like that time we friggin' story we told the last t- time with when we were in. Scranton, and we and we yeah. didn't recognize it was it was like the bass player from Testament or whatever. Yeah, it was uh, Greg Christensen. <laughs> yeah, we just walked right past him. Oh God! And but, the only guy that actually was happy to see us. <laughs> yeah, of course. What a bunch of assholes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, well, yeah, close up musicianship, and also, well, I'm. Before we close this out with the music, because I think we should, I think we really should. Well, I was going to ask, what's your favorite album? Let's let's do favorite Merciful uh, yeah, Fate gonna album same, and first King thing. Diamond or favorite King Diamond. Okay. And I guess we could also talk about some of the themes from like his uh, his concept albums because we hadn't really yeah. talked about them. But like, uh, long story short, Abigail is um, Abigail is like it takes place in like the 17th century. Mm-hmm. 18th century 1777 on the seventh day of july we'll probably listen to that song um we um like so that album is basically about like you know this family they move into this house and um and the and the year there, there's a demon spirit in the house and it's not like and everything is not well and uh, this newlywed couple they move into the house and uh, there's like a curse, and they don't know about it from like years ago. And they, and you know, the, the the wife gets pregnant, as you know, a newlywed couple would so do. And they, um, 
and it turns out that the baby is being possessed by the demon. So it's a demon that's living inside this inside this wife, and he has to kill her. And he doesn't want to do it, but he does, and that doesn't really do anything because Abigail is still there, like the spirit of Abigail is still there. And we find that out in Abigail 2, The Revenge, which I think you yeah. can take that away. So Abigail 2, The Revenge, Abigail is basically... Like, the spirit of Abigail become like manifests into like an actual girl. And the girl stumbles across the mansion, and we find out that the character, the main character, the, the, the husband character, Jonathan, is not actually dead at the end of Abigail. He's just crippled, so he's confined to a wheelchair. And so she stumbles across this mansion in a storm. He takes her in. He believes, like, he sees her as his dead wife, Miriam, even though it's really Abigail. And so she learns the truth about everything because she doesn't know that she's Abigail reincarnated. She just, you know, is, you know, this lost girl in the woods. But she learns the truth about everything and then she puts broken glass in his dinner and kills him. <laughs> and then, like, everybody dies because the friggin' mansion gets set on fire and it's it's a whole thing. It's, it's, a, it's a really good, it would make a really good horror movie yeah. and, and a sequel. Um... It's it's just it's it's kind of like a, a silly concept and it's a little convoluted, but like once you like listen to it and you read the liner notes and you like okay, this is actually could work. It's it's pretty cool. It's it's, it's a good little a little good little concept. Yeah, and the same deal for them. Them is the only other one that gets a sequel. Um, yes. Yeah. Them is basically um, King Diamond and um, and and his and his little sister and his family and whatever. Their grandma's coming back from wherever she was for a long time. And um, they don't really know what the hell happened to her. But, like, she went away. She went on vacation or whatever it is that, like, mom told her. Because there's supposed to be... It's supposed to be a very young king and his sister. Um, mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I guess this is the event that traumatizes him into becoming King Diamond. If you want to look <laughs> at it from, like, a meta perspective. But... Yeah. Um, but... Uh, Young King, uh, that sounds funny. Young King is, uh, <laughs> Grandma comes home, and Grandma's, like, quite mysterious and, like, a little weird. And, like, she's not really talking much, but, like, she has to have this, like, cup of tea. And there's, like, these weird, like, noises and stuff. And they're, like, what's going what There's something up with the tea. And then he notices that, like, when she drinks the tea or whatever, that, like, there's spirits coming to life. And, like, there's teacups and, like, the tea party that grandma's having with the invisible guests, essentially, like all of like, you know, all of the silver and everything is like floating on its own. And it's all like this crazy ghostly crap. And there's like voices coming from the tea and it's all the demons that inhabit the teapot essentially. And, you know, the, and like grandma, we find out has been like away from like a mental institution this whole time, probably mm -hmm. driven mad by them. Because she's probably like, oh, I'm talking to my friends, and they're manipulating her to do whatever it was that she did. We don't really know what happened to Grandpa or anything. So, like, th so there's, like, you know, there's this whole other thing that we find out as to, like, where she, was, where she came from and what happened. And, like, King Diamond finds out that, like, the spirits in the teapot, them, they're evil. And the teapot is actually called Amen. Like, the house is called Amen too. But it's mm -hmm. the, the teapot. Um, and like Deicide's, the, the death metal band Deicide originally was called Amen, taking their name from um, from um, from the Them album. And, uh, the, oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. The, and then like when they got signed to Roadrunner, uh, Monty Connor, who was uh, the, in charge of Roadrunner at the time, I don't know if he still is or if he's even still alive. He probably, I don't think Roadrunner exists anymore, does it? <laughs> um, I think it does, but I, I, I don't know. Um, and you don't hear much about them, but no, the, um, but like when, when they signed Deicide, they were like, oh, we can't, you, you have to change your name because, um, because of the King Diamond album. And he was like, what are you talking about? And they were like, you just have to do it. He's like, but th this is stupid, but okay. Like they, like, we still get paid. Right. It basically was like the gist of it. Um, but yeah, it's also like Eamon belongs to them, but also the teapot. I like I was listening to it yesterday, and like the teapot, he also calls the teapot Eamon, 
So I don't know if it's one or the other or both. Could be both. I don't know. But regardless, um, he smashes the teapot and, like, um, no, his sister finds out, too. He tells his sister. His sister finds out, and she smashes the teapot, and the spirits get angry, and they, like, essentially, like, they, like, grab her, and they, like, take her off to the fire, and they essentially, like, we, we assume that they, like, that, like, his sister was, like, burned and, like, died. Um, yeah. I don't know what the hell, and, like, um, they drain the mother of her life force, too. So, like, I guess, I, I, I'm not sure if, like, the mom dies or not. I think it's implied that she does. <laughs> but, like, but then at the end of it, it's, like, King Diamond versus Grandma, and, and, and them, essentially, um, like, young king versus grandma and uh he like pushes her down the stairs or whatever he like there's some there's, Everyone's getting pushed down the stairs a, in king diamond albums there's a recurring theme with wheelchairs and being thrown down stairs i don't, I don't yeah. know what's going on apparently king diamond grew up in a really dangerous household yes where <laughs> stairs were a constant threat I, I, uh, maybe maybe we have to we don't know for sure but probably um, <laughs> there's some kind of trauma in his life surrounding wheelchairs and stairs. So yeah. I can only imagine. Um, hopefully he never watches the WWE pay-per-view TLC <laughs> for tables, <laughs> ladders, chairs, and stairs. Tables, ladders, chairs, wheelchairs, and stairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just about every international object you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, I would like to say them also <laughs> it got its uh, there was a kind of a claim to fame with them is that it was two of the songs were featured in Clerks 2. Yes. Um, welcome Invisible. Home. Yeah. Welcome Home was played and Invisible Guests. Uh, they sing Invisible Guests to to scare uh, oh, Elias. Yeah. Yeah. And also like and also the I think the Invisible Guest was made fun of on uh, Beavis and Butthead. I know. Um, there were a few, there were a few uh, Beavis and Butthead things, which that also helped King Diamond's popularity was being like made fun of on Beavis and Butthead multiple. His his music videos were kind of silly. Let's, yes, I mean, that's... that is that is something to point out. His like as great as his music is, the videos are pretty terrible. Yes, like like, oh, like give me your soul. That was like... that's my favorite because it's so. I mean, even the lyrics are silly. Where it's like he's not very nice. Yeah, yeah like. <laughs> You have to ask nicely to get because you just have to. The name of the album is "Give Me Your Soul, Please." Yeah. At, at least he's at least he's polite. That's all I can say about that. But like anyway, so they have a showdown, and then King Diamond gets taken off to the mental institute, and then we have the phone call, which was a bonus track, which is like Grandma, like he like kills Grandma basically. <laughs> And the phone call, honestly, is one of the creepiest tracks ever creepy. recorded for a musical album ever. Yeah, like, it's literally, it's like a horror movies. movie. Yeah. yeah it, it I, is, I'm getting chills thinking about it. I don't... Listen to it at, like, freaking midnight while you're sitting in your room alone in the dark, and it's like... Yeah, don't you do get, that. <laughs> the freaking hair on your neck will raise. Like, it's creepy. It's really bad. I did that one time, I think because you told me to, because you did it. And like I had trouble sleeping that night. I think this is when I was living in my this is when I was living in my parents' basement and it was very oh, yeah. dark and the pipes would rattle. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that was very creepy. I couldn't sleep in I, I actually slept upstairs on the couch for like a week. Oh. Yeah, it's 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 creepy. Uh, and, yeah, and very then, well done. Yeah, very well done and creepy, so it does its job. The album's great. Yeah. And then there's conspiracy, which this is actually the thing that King Diamond got sued over with the makeup mm -hmm. of Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons claimed that they had th that their makeup was too similar, so he tried to sue him because Gene Simmons just his like whole which, motivation is to extract as much money out of the Kiss name as possible. Um, which and their make makeup is which, not even close. No, like it's, really, it has, it's it's like night and day. Like they just yes. to have like black and white colors that were chosen but there's but like king diamond is like blood on um, like it's like blood yes part of it and like there's like a spider web on top of his head it like looks nothing like gene simmons at all no. but like it was just such a stupid lawsuit that he was like i'll just change my makeup then you idiot and yeah he ended up having cooler makeup anyway yeah um, and he stopped wearing the cape to go with <laughs> it and like he wore like the you know the cool like funeral garb that he's got on now so he looks like a cool sorcerer um yeah anyway 
but like then there's conspiracy because of the phone call set up and like why and like the phone call set up is like I'm it's your grandma and I'm not dead I'm possessed and we and like we put you in this institution so like now and so like now he's going back because he realizes that the whole thing was in the house and he has to go burn down the house basically there's also a lot with burning down houses in his albums too yeah there yeah. there are some recurring themes. <laughs> Yeah, so those are, like, the famous ones, but unfortunately in Conspiracy, he, like, dies. Like, he yeah. dies, like, trying to do it, and I don't think that he, like, achieves it, because they're horror-themed albums, so, like, why would they have happy endings? Right. Um, then there's the, um, then there's, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's a ton of them. I don't want to die. I don't think we're going to get into all of them. I mean, we, could, we could spend three hours going through and analyzing the plot of every King Diamond album. But you get the gist. Like, they're basically, every single one is, like, horror-themed, um, various different horror concepts. Um, it, they're, they're really good. They're just, they're, they're nice. It's like, it's like listening to a horror movie, basically. The plots are, like, really well done. There's a lot of, like, twists and turns in the music, and there's a lot of, like, cliffhangers and, and stuff to keep you hooked till the end. Um, so let's, let's, I guess, let, you know, let's do our favorite Let's do favorite Merciful Fate album first. Uh, that's hard because they're. I think it's Don't Break the Oath. Okay, that's fair. I'm gonna go with not, Melissa. And, and not even just because of the tattoo. I yeah. Like I actually wasn't even supposed to get this tattoo. I was actually supposed to be getting um, Sodom's M16 album art on my arm. But it actually really? didn't, yeah, I was actually supposed to get that, and I went in to do the tattoo that day, and it turned out that, like, the picture that the guy blew up, like, for the proper size, it was too big. So, oh. So it would have looked funny on my arm, or he would have had to put it somewhere else, and mm -hmm. I, like, I don't, and I was just, like, not feeling it, because I wanted it to go, I wanted a tattoo in that specific area, because it, yeah. it would have been under my forbidden tattoo of forbidden evil which was my first yeah. tattoo and he would have either had to go through it or it just would have gone over it and it would have looked funny when i moved my arm so i was like well we can't do that and then like i was like i'm so sorry but we got to reschedule this and i got to go home and think about this and um mm -hmm. and i did i almost i also had thought about getting an iron maiden tattoo which would have been cool also but i decided yeah. it would have looked better on my leg which I don't know if I'll still get that at some point. It's been such a long time. I don't well, the Don't Break the Oath album art is, like, really badass, yeah, so, so I, I it's a good it, tattoo. Yeah, so I ended up going with that anyway. And then, of course, my mom saw it, and she was like, does it have to be a demon? And I'm like, well, it's already there, so I guess one day I'll get a cross for you. <laughs> I still have to get that cross. <laughs> yeah. But I've I've also been thinking about getting the Black Sabbath cross just because then then it makes everyone happy. Yeah. Um, yes. So so don't break the oath is my favorite. Um, okay. Just because the al the album itself is just very very good. I mean I had gotten the, the tattoo because it was my favorite Merciful Fate album, and I had been to Diamond for Halloween multiple times anyway, so it made sense. Might as well do something that gets closer to home. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go with Melissa, the classic, you know, first album. I, it, I think it's got a lot of great songs on it. You know, Curse of the Pharaohs, Into the Coven, Melissa, uh, you know, At the Sound of the Demon. They're all great. It, it's it's just a great album. So that's that's my my merciful fate one is, is definitely Melissa. Um, and for King Diamond, I would have to say probably Abigail is my favorite album. Yeah. Uh, for me, for me, it's them. Them is a good one too. For me, it's them. It's like that's what got me hooked. On I like music. them. I like the music of them a lot, and I, I think it's a great. I like the setting of Abigail more. That's why I like Abigail a little bit more. I like the like you know, the colonial you know, times. colonial times. Like it's like you know, I, I don't know. It's feels more like mysterious and magical i guess <laughs> yeah. yeah i also like the puppet master a lot that one grew on me a lot um and um well mm -hmm. my 
my favorite like my, my favorite song is uh is actually from um from Voodoo. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite song is Loa House, which is uh, which you know that's another really cool one that has to deal with like you know obviously like voodoo stuff and it's in yeah. Louisiana uh, in like a similar setting and it's very it's also very cool. But for me, there's just something about them. It's just like this is what really got me hooked, and I never really stopped. Yeah, I I, I never stopped listening to King Diamond after that. Yeah, I mean even into like when I even into like thrash metal singing. A lot of that stuff came from King Diamond. Yeah. That like yeah. from what I used from how I used to sing in like certain bands that I played in. Uh, obviously, I didn't really do that in like the Zamboni Nuclear Hatred stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, in in our other band with uh, with our friend Joe, um, Raging Steel, I, I did a lot more. Oh yeah. Fedo stuff, and that was a lot more King Diamond. I didn't do that too much in this other band, Turbulence, with my friend Alex, who we've uh, shouted out on the show a couple of times. Um, mm -hmm. We there was a little bit here and there, but not really that much. But like we always used to like make fun of King Diamond. <laughs> and also because I was like sh because I'm short I also like looked exactly like King Diamond <laughs> so like when I was King Diamond for Halloween I w like we would go out to the village um, in um, in New York City on Halloween which I haven't done that for years and there's like a big parade that they do and it's like people in costume and like whoever they have and there's this really great parade and they go I don't I, I don't know exactly how far they go but they go from like St. Mark's to at least Union Square, but they go they go a little bit farther than that, and it's it's a ton of fun. But when I went, but like I had the cane and everything, and like all these people were like were like walking up to me, like screaming "Grandma" and like giving me the horns and everything. It was a lot of fun. It's hilarious. All right, do we want to listen to some King Diamond yeah, before we sign off? Yes. Oh, which would we like to, do we want to do like two King Diamonds and two Merciful Fates? Uh, we can. I mean, the songs are kind of longer though, so maybe oh, we can do one of each. Yeah. All right. And then, do we only want to do one? Like, all right. So, do do we want to do our favorite songs from like one era and the other? To really give people an idea? Yeah, that works. All right. So, all right. So, I'll, so I guess we just start at the beginning. Um, do you want to be the King Diamond one or the Merciful Fate one? Uh, uh, I, I don't care. Whatever you want to do. All right. Well, I want to be the King Diamond one then. All right. So, I'll, I'll pick a Merciful Fate. So let, uh, but, like, yeah, you start first. All right. So, I guess let's do Come to the Sabbath. Okay. For, for Merciful Fate. It's a good one. Alrighty. And this is from Don't Break the Oath. Yeah. I love the amount of reverb that's always on Merciful Fate and King Diamond songs too. It like just sounds like he's singing like a cathedral or something. Yeah. And the like the harpsichord too. In the Merciful yeah. Fate songs. It, like, it really adds depth to everything that you Yeah. And, like, and it's like such a weird Yeah. It's such a weird instrument to feature in a heavy metal band, like harpsichord. <laughs> you would never think. But it works for some it, it, it does.
think the song's a good, like, uh, exposition of, like, how King sings, too, and how he changes his voice from, like, the high register down to the low register. Yeah, it's a good display of his style. It's yeah. also very bouncy. Yes. I mean, I, I think the King Diamond stuff is like where I started doing the weird dances in the car. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so, like everybody who doesn't know, I have a bunch of really stupid dance moves that I pretty much only do during like long drives. <laughs> while I'm sitting in the passenger seat, I never do this while driving. That would be fine. Well, <laughs> <laughs> But I always do like these really stupid ones, like the chainsaw and the machine gun, which is a variation of the chainsaw. There's like can can, there's all kinds of stupid things that I do with my body. That sounds fun. <laughs> the lawn sprinkler. Yeah, the lawn sprinkler. That's almost more like a <laughs> I like how this changes You know, it's, it's interesting because this is a Merciful Fate song, but it, this part specifically almost, like, the guitar solo almost sounds like it could be on a King Diamond. Like, it's very, like, you could see the natural progression from the Merciful Fate stuff into King Diamond with this album. Yeah. And also, like, just the chorus on that, too. And, like, it's mm-hmm. also, like, going down, like, an octave. Yeah. Like, or going up an octave, rather. And here's back to the cool harpsichord. Yeah. And then slowly fades into being a guitar. Yeah. So cool. Goes into a new part. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really it's, cool. Yep. And like the and like the changes make sense too. Yes. Like it doesn't sound like there's like three or four songs fighting. Like it all makes sense. Yes. That's that. That's murder. Oh, yeah. And now we will take you to Loa House from uh, the King Diamond album Voodoo. That's my favorite song. So now you can kind of hear what's going on. Yeah. Like, what he's going for. Yeah. I love like, feeling like your chest will like you feel like alive basically, like it feels like yes. a lightning bolt is Yeah. That's kinda of what this song does. Yeah. I, it's, it's, his songs have like this bouncy quality that you makes you wanna like get up and like move and like you know like Dance and, and mosh, you know? Yeah, well, that's the why I dance in the car. Yeah. <laughs> there's so much dread going on. 
Yes. Like, I usually hate the first song of an album, mm-hmm. but this, this was the perfect way to start this album. Yeah. I think there's also broken glass involved in this album. <laughs> Probably. You know, it's really difficult to make a concept album that, like, to tell a story and also make it make musical sense and rhyme and stuff, and King Diamond really does a great job of doing that. You know? And the riff is so good. Yes. Like, you can't see me, and I'm air the whole thing. Yeah. And I'm looking like a jackass at midnight. And I don't care. It's just so good. I wish he could play this one. Yeah, that would be... The last time I saw him, he played the booty in the job. And I was like, I'm surprised that I don't need to play it. Yeah. I was like... I'm glad you did this, and I'm glad you picked something from this album. Can it be my favorite next time? <laughs> It'd be great if they did, like, a, you know, they picked, like, a song from every King Diamond that were Merciful Fate album and played, like, a set list of, like, one song or two songs from each album. He has enough material. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's at least, like, 17 songs. Yes. And we see like the changes, you know, the song changes and like shifts and it it's like it's so different but at the same time it works. Like it doesn't like feel out of place when the song like changes. Just tempo changes and, and key changes, it just sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Like something bad happens to every old person in his album. I think in this, yeah, I think Grandpa eats glass and dies in this one. <laughs> I don't know, something happens. There's also a beef for dust, whatever that is. It's probably some voodoo stuff. I think they meet like Baron Simmons. Oh, really? Yeah. I gotta listen. I gotta listen to it in like all the time. Yeah. Like the album itself. King Diamond has listened to it yesterday. And it's now. Yeah. I love that. I wish I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and also the Razor's Edge too. So those three songs, so these three are like my top three songs of all time. And I'm sure at this point, with some people, I've lost all credibility. And again. And again. And again. And again. Credibility. <laughs> ah. uh, my favorite, my favorite King Diamond song is Black Horseman, uh, which is on obviously, and it's on Abigail. That's another great song, and that's one of my top songs of all time as well. It, it's just, there's just, there's just so many good King Diamond songs. It's like he's one of those guys that you could like basically take any King Diamond album and find a really good song on, like, which is it, it's it's rare, you know, for for a band to be that to to have that kind of longevity and and be able to kind of like you know still make great music. And I, it, 
yeah, part of it is King Diamond, but also, like you said, or part of it is also the musicians that he has with, you know, Andy LaRoe, because it's just, it's an all-around great band, and Merciful Fate is also really great. It would be nice to get another Merciful Fate album, too. I think he wants to, and I think he's been, like, meaning to do it for, like, a time, uh-huh. but he just... Like, he just hasn't gotten around to it. He hasn't, like, it just hasn't felt right to him. I mean, he's a very spiritual guy himself anyway. Yeah. But, I mean, there's even, like, even this silly song that he has is funny. He's a, there's, there's a song called No Presents for Christmas, which is <laughs> literally, like, it's just a hilarious song. And it's just, like, the one King Diamond song where it's not serious. And um, there's, like, I mean, I'll, you know, what the hell, I'll play it. But also there's, like, a thing that exists of... Um, what like it was like uh merciful fate was like playing with metallica for like that sounds wrong um <laughs> they were um they were playing a show um in california in like the 80s and it was like james's birthday um so like they did like a no presents for christmas thing with like metallica and they yeah. went out and it was like a birthday present thing for james Hetfield, and mm-hmm. it was, like no presents for james yeah, I remember that. <laughs> it's pretty funny. All right, I'll put on this song because it's just, it's, like, it's it's so not, like, it's such, like, what you would not expect King Diamond to do, but it's, like, and it's freaking hilarious, and, like, you know, I'll, I'll just let it speak for itself, but there's cartoon characters getting wasted in this movie, in this movie. <laughs> song. <laughs> <laughs> Best Christmas song ever made. <laughs> yeah, probably. And they like they play this live too. Like they yes. always like close with <laughs> just so silly. <laughs> like he's like he's like hugging a reindeer. Yeah. <laughs> what if it was a real reindeer? Mm. Like freaking jingle all the way. <laughs> what if he's just like I don't want to destroy it. I just wanna wanna play reindeer. <laughs> we gotta have to do that for an episode two. Or is the cowardly dog? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Save <laughs> for me, so help me, hey. <laughs> you know, I try to sing along to King Diamond. I can't hit those notes anymore. <laughs> Too screwed up. The years of I metal just, singing. I think I can hear there, but I don't think I can do it consistently. Yeah, it's it's really hard. Yeah. You have to like punch yourself in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure he has like. You know, tons of vocal training he does, and you know, probably drinks like honey right before he goes on stage. Yeah. Yeah. I like how there's like the little interlude in the middle of like Bobby kissing Santa Claus. And then it goes right back into the guitar solo. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Like it's cheesy, but it's like playing at the same time. Yeah.
song was harder for him to write because it was goofy. Yeah. <laughs> nah, he's probably a pretty goofy guy in real life. Yeah, probably. Like a bath, a, a bath from friggin' Immortal is like, he's kind of a goofy dude, he just, he's just like jokes around, he's not really, he's not like a fucking stereotypical fucking black metal dude. No, you have to have a sense of humor to be able to do this as well as he does. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Well, everybody, that was King Diamond. I hope everybody listening enjoyed. Should go out and, and buy some albums or listen on Spotify or wherever you get your music. Yep. Give King Diamond some money. Yeah. The man has earned it, and he's quite talented. Yes. All right, but thank you guys for coming to our Sabbath. Yes. And why does this exist? I'm Chris. I'm Rob. And remember, everyone, question everything. <laughs>